Welcome to this training, uh, which is an introduction to directive-based uh, GPU programming. And uh, the idea is to move from the uh, CPU that is mainly used for uh, execution of uh, HPC code and that are very uh, optimized for uh, low latency and general purpose and they are optimized for a wide range of distinct tasks that we run sequentially as fast as possible. This means that you have uh, optimization like out of order uh, execution, you have uh, a large cache that is available on CPUs. You have all these things that is designed in order to make a sequential task run as fast as possible and for the CPU to uh, finish the job on the task and pick up uh, the next task as fast as possible. So this is uh, the, uh, the case for a CPU, latency optimized, and then you have graphic processing units, uh, GPUs that are optimized for throughput. Uh, they're very specialized at uh, the, the, the core of it. At the beginning, it were, uh, they were very specialized for graphics processing. And with time, they uh, start to appear in HPC uh, for very highly parallel uh, computing. And if you want to program a GPU, you have uh, several options. Uh, the first one, of course, is to use the low living language that is uh, provided most of the time by the vendors. So for NVIDIA, you have the option of CUDA. If you choose to go for a, an AMD GPU, then you can use IP that in theory can run also on CUDA with the portability layers. And then you have a uh, vendor neutral solution, which is OpenCL that will run as well as NVIDIA, AMD, and uh, Intel uh, GPUs. So these low level language, most of the time are based on C++ and the kernel language looks more like uh, C. And then you have high level frameworks like Cocos, Raja, Alpaca, uh, that are uh, designed as kind of libraries that you can use in order to uh, describe the parallel execution you want to do, and then do this, uh, let the framework do uh, the work. And you also have some kind of standard that is designed by the Kronos group, the same that designed OpenCL, which is a uh, cycle. And that is also used by Intel for the, G the Intel uh, GPUs. Uh, but Intel called that DEC++, uh, data parallel C++. And then you have the third option, which is based on directive, and that is the topic of today, uh, which for which you have uh, two uh, contender. You have OpenMP that was very popular for uh, multi-threaded programming and then extended uh, for GPUs. And then you have OpenECC, which was designed from the ground up to target accelerators like uh, GPUs. So as I said, you have two options, OpenMP or OpenCC. Uh, OpenMP is very uh, general purpose. It was uh, designed at the origin for multi-threaded programming on shared memory system. And in this model, the programmer explicitly, explicitly spread the execution of loops, uh, code regions, and tasks across uh, teams of threads that are in charge of the parallel execution. And then you have OpenECC, uh, purely oriented uh, towards accelerators. And uh, on the, it's kind of a different philosophy as OpenMP, uh, meaning that the programmer just tells the compiler which loop can be parallelized and let the compiler do the mapping to the target architecture. So uh, these two models use uh, directives and these directives basically uh, takes uh, the form of in C starting with a pragma and then you have OMP in the case of OpenMP that says to the compiler that this is an OpenMP directive and then you have a construct and closes that's described to the compiler what you want to achieve. This is the same principle in OpenSC, just that the uh, OMP is replaced by ACC. And these directives are interpreted by the uh, compilers and the compiler will do the work for you to transform your code so that it can be compiled and run uh, on a GPU. So the philosophy of these two models are uh, very similar in terms of uh, the way you implement your program in OpenMP or OpenCC, 
that uh, OpenMP is very uh, descriptive while OpenECC is prescriptive. Okay, so let's start with uh, OpenMP first. So uh, OpenMP at, uh, before version four was just designed uh, for multi-threaded execution. So basically it was able to uh, create teams of threads that then uh, will execute on the CPUs and these threads execute on different core of the CPUs, then uh, allowing for parallel execution, concurrent execution. Uh, with OpenMP4, uh, some uh, constructs were introduced in order to support the GPUs. And then it was significantly extended in version uh, 4.5 and uh, 5. Uh, and these uh, trends follow uh, the HPC market when the role of accelerator was more and more uh, significant due to the fact that the CPU uh, cannot keep up with the demand in terms of uh, compute uh, power needed by scientists. So scientists start to move to accelerators like GPUs and this uh, OpenMP that was very popular among uh, the HPC community starts including uh, GPU support. And of course, GPUs are the most common type of accelerator and we will focus uh, today on GPUs, but OpenMP is not limited to GPUs. In theory, you can use it with any kind of accelerators like uh, not NEX, but NEC, uh, Aurora, uh, FPGAs and ASICs. Uh, so um, this is uh, not exactly limited to GPUs and basically it make it easier to target multiple heterogeneous architecture using the same code base, because in theory, you write your code in OpenMP and then the compiler will do the work in order to compile it and uh, make sure that it can execute on the uh, target architecture that uh, you uh, want to uh, use. Okay, what is the execution model? As I said, uh, OpenMP uh, at the start was just targeting CPU and then it was extended to uh, accelerators. And the idea you have in this programming model is that first you start on the, on the host, okay, where the execution starts. And most of the case, this is a, a CPU, okay. And then you will move execution to a device, okay. That can be one or um, several accelerator or coprocessors. And these accelerators need to be uh, of the same uh, type, okay, but uh, OpenMP don't say what kind of accelerator you have, but if you want to execute, you need to look on multiple accelerators at the same time, these uh, accelerators need to be of the same type, okay. So if we consider first uh, OS multi-threading, so how to execute in parallel on uh, OS with OpenMP, and that we take as an example, uh, SACSP, so uh, single precision A, multiply by uh, uh, x multiply by a plus uh, y. Uh, then what you will do on uh, for a CPU execution is that you will use a pragma OMP parallel for creating a parallel region. So uh, spawning a teams of threads, okay? And then you will say to the compiler that the next loops need to be uh, divided among uh, the, the threads and each of the threads will do some work on a chunk of the loop. And for that, you will use uh, the for or do in Fortran directives that uh, indicates to the compiler that the next loop needs to be uh, parallelized. So this is how you will do that on uh, CPU. Now, if you want to move this execution to the GPU, you will use the target directive. So what you say when you use a target directive is that you instruct the compiler to generate a target task that will execute uh, the next code block uh, on a device. So you start your program on the host, the CPU, okay, and the master thread or main thread now, the name of the master thread that will change to main thread will start, okay, and when it reach a pragma or MP target construct, then uh, the execution will move to the device and then the code block that is included in this OpenMP target. So in this case, this is the, the, the loop, okay, will be executed on the device. And when execution finish, okay, the next code, when the code block is finished, so the curly brace or the end target parallel in the case of Fortran, then we go back to the host, host and uh, resume execution on uh, the, the, the master thread of the host. So 
pretty easy. You take exactly the same uh, code that you use on the CPU, but add the target directive saying, okay, we want to move the execution on a target device. And uh, in addition to uh, this, you can, of course, determine the number of devices that you have in your environment. This can be done with runtime functions. Okay, if you include openmp.h, you have access to these functions. And uh, you can use the OpenMP uh, get new device uh, routine that returns the number of uh, target device available to you. Okay. And uh, in addition to that, these devices are uh, assigned an ID that goes to zero from n device minus one. And uh, in a target region, you can choose the device that you want to use uh, using uh, the device clause that goes. Uh, on the target uh, region. So in this example, uh, I want my laser, please. Yep. So in this example, you have the you move execution to the device and you specify the type of the, 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 the number of the device that you want to use. Okay. And in addition to that, you have OpenMP is initial device uh, routine that returns true if the current task is executing on the host, meaning the CPU and false if this is not the case. So the initial device is where the execution of the program starts. So this is uh, the CPU. Well, in addition to that, you have to understand that uh, the, the memory space of the CPU and of uh, the uh, GPU are uh, separate, okay? So uh, when you uh, create variables or arrays that are present on the host, so the CPU, uh, they are not present directly in the device memory. Uh, you need to explicitly say, okay, I will use uh, this data to the uh, GPUs and it needs to be moved uh, into the device memory, okay? And the same is true if you allocate memory on the device, but then need to use the data that you, uh, the values that you generated on the uh, GPU, then you need to move this uh, result to the host memory, the CPU memory. So you have uh, some kind of uh, data clause uh, which are uh, described by the map, okay? Meaning how to map the memory from the host to the device. And then you have a, an identifier that specifies the type of movement that you want to do. And then you have a list of variable or the uh, arrays that you want to move to uh, the device. And this uh, type, can take a different value. For example, you can use alloc, meaning that you want to allocate uh, memory on the device. You have two, meaning that you want to uh, allocate memory to the device and then copy the original value of an array of variables from the host memory to the device. And then you have from, which is the opposite. You uh, allocate memory on the device, okay? you do some work with it. And at the end of the execution, uh, the uh, value that you generated to, um, from the device, then you take them and copy them back to the host, the CPU. And you have to from, which is a combination of to and from, and is also the default if you don't specify the type. Uh, this is good practice to uh, uh, specify the type every, every type, every, um, every time because then uh, it's more readable. You understand more clearly what is going on with the data movement. Uh, so the two from meaning that you will uh, move the data from the host to the device, do some execution of the device on the device, and then at the end, copy back this data generated on the device to uh, the, the host uh, memory. So when you use a C, C++ and you move uh, data from the device to the host or from the host to the uh, device, you need to uh, specify uh, the number of elements that you want to copy. Uh, if you uh, copy the whole array, it's not required in Fortran because the, the, the Fortran can determine that uh, at compile time or run time. Uh, but basically if you do a malloc, of course, the size of the array is not known by the uh, the compiler, so it doesn't know how to move the data uh, to and from the, the, the GPU. So you need to uh, specify uh, that you want, for example, in this case, 
uh, take the array B, okay, and then you want to start from index zero and then copy uh, N elements uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the device. If you are copying uh, a scanner, then you don't need to do that. You can simply say that you want to uh, uh, copy to and from the device the value A. You don't, of course, need to specify the size of this variable. Okay, and you don't need to do that. Note that uh, you can also copy part of an array, okay? When uh, in C, C++, you specify the starting index and then the number of elements that you want to copy from this index. Uh, in Fortran, uh, you, the syntax is different where you have to specify uh, the start of uh, the index, uh, the, the, the start of the value that you want to copy, but then uh, the, it's not the number of elements that you want to copy, but uh, the end, okay, the end index of uh, the value you want to, to copy. Okay, so it, this is done so that uh, it match the way uh, the language uh, is uh, built. So it means that it matches the, the general syntax of the language. Uh, because in C, of course, when you create an array, you just specify its size. Uh, in the case of Fortran, you can specify this, uh, the, the range of uh, index that you want to use. So uh, of course, OpenMP reflects that uh, in the syntax. Okay, so if we take our uh, SACSP example, the first version of it didn't uh, present any uh, data uh, movement clause. It means that the, there is a huge chance that when you execute it, you will have some kind of segmentation fault on the device. And most of the time, it's not even as explicit as that. As that. So if you forget to copy some data to the uh, GPU, you may have some cryptic uh, error message uh, that appears. So it's very important to think about it. And in the case of our SACSP example, what we need to do is, okay, we will use Y and we will use X. X, uh, we will only uh, read the value of X. So what we can do is just uh, copy the value to the device. And at the end of the execution, we don't need to bring it back to the host. In the case of Y, okay, we read the value. So we need the initial value of Y, but we also uh, do some modification to the array. So it means that we need to do a two from movement uh, from the host and device because we need the initial value that we set on uh, the host. And then when we finish the calculation, we need to bring it back to uh, this host because we did some modification on the device. In the case of A, uh, which is a scanner, we uh, don't have to map it explicitly. So the default value, in default clause uh, that is uh, used will be first private. Uh, that is also a data clause that is present uh, if you know OpenMP for uh, uh, CPU. And it means that basically the, the initial value of this variable will be copied to the target device, but at the end of the execution, it will not be uh, copied back to the host. It means that if you do some modification of a scalar value on a GPU, then you need to map it explicitly with a to from or a from uh, a map clause in order to make sure that the modification you do on the device will be visible to the host at the end of the device execution. Okay, but if you only use a scalar, then you don't need to uh, think about it, it will be uh, present in the GPU memory uh, during the execution it will be, and with the initial value, it comes from uh, the host. The two from the default uh, Some compiler detects that an array is present. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem in Fortran because most of the time they can determine it. So I mean, I, uh, if you don't specify for why, it's okay. Most of the time, the compiler will don't bother looking at arrays and don't compute to a, a default one. It depends on the compiler. The NVIDIA compiler do a lot of analysis because the NVIDIA compiler was designed by PGI for OpenCC that do a lot of things by default. And then when they start, I would say, embracing OpenMP, then they use that. But in the standard, it's not said if the compiler is supposed to detect if a uh, value needs to be moved. Only for Scala. Scala, okay, for private by default. And then the data is moved. Uh, basically, it follows the same idea as CUDA. 
in CUDA when you call a function and it's always some uh, scalar as par parameters, the runtime will copy the value automatically. It will be present in GPU memory. But if you don't do a coup mal a malloc on the device, then the data is not present. If you pass an, a, a pointer to a function, you could. So it's exactly the same with OpenMP. You need to explicitly move the data like in CUDA or if. So if you already know GPU programming, it makes sense. But of course, uh, you may think, OK, the compiler see that this array is used and can do the copy by default. But the problem in C is that it cannot determine the size of the array at the beginning. Right? At the compile time, neither at runtime. Yeah, it may, but it's a lot of work in the runtime to do this kind of thing, because you have to track every malloc. So a lot of overhead. So basically, if you have an array, you need to copy it by hand and specify. OK, about uh, compilers. Uh, Clang uh, and the NVIDIA compiler have support for OpenMP as well as uh, GCC. Uh, Clang is also used by uh, AMD. Uh, this is present in uh, Rockem. Uh, the Clang support for NVIDIA is mainly from uh, the community, the LLVM community. So it's not really supported by NVIDIA, NVIDIA but sometimes NVIDIA contributes also because NVIDIA has its own. A compiler in NVC and NV Fortran that is available through the HPC SDK since version uh, of this year, so the 21.x. Uh, and basically, uh, for Clang, you have to activate, uh, uh, of course, the interpretation of OpenMP directive. This is uh, already the case if you uh, know OpenMP for CPU, you need to pass this F OpenMP. Uh, flag, and then you need to specify an additional flag, which is FOPNP targets, okay, and then you specify the type of architecture that you want to uh, target. So in the case of NVIDIA, it's NVPTX64 NVIDIA CUDA. Uh, if you are targeting an AMD GPU, then it's AMD GCN, AMD, AMD HSA. So yes, it's very verbose. And then you have additional uh, flag that you need to pass in order to specify the uh, target GPU, so the type of GPU that you want uh, to do. So this is done passing this X OpenMP target with the, the type of architecture. And then you have an M arch that basically uh, for NVIDIA uh, describe the compute capability that you are targeting. And in the case of AMD, the uh, identifier of the GPU you are targeting. So for example, if you take the most uh, recent one, the MI100 that is available, you have GFX908. And in the future, when the MI200 and 250X, then you have another identifier that will probably be 90A. Uh, but this is very important for AMD because the code is really, uh, in the case of uh, NVIDIA, this is kind of a, a intermediate language that is used, NVPTX. In case of AMD, this is really a binary that is described. So you need to specify the type of GPU you are targeting or it might not run. So the same for NVIDIA, but unfortunately it's way more shorter. So to activate OpenMP, you use the dash MP flag, and you say that you want to uh, have uh, offloading enabled, meaning you pass the GPU. You can also activate this M info uh, equals MP that will give you information on what the, GP, the, the compiler is doing. And then you specify the type of GPU you are targeting. So the uh, basically the uh, compute capability that you uh, are targeting. <laughs> you can also use uh, GCC. Uh, the performance of GCC in terms of uploading is quite poor, uh, but in recent version it's improving. So it's not on par with Clang or in the NVIDIA compiler, but it's improving with time. So maybe one day uh, GCC will be a good option, but anyway, it is available. Uh, you, um, it mainly supports uh, NVIDIA, but there is some work to support uh, in the uh, GPUs as well. Okay. So we have seen that we are uh, moved in execution with a target directive, and then we can uh, execute in parallel using a parallel four, but we will see that this is not sufficient and this is linked to the fact that uh, GPUs are hierarchical uh, hardware, okay? Uh, so a, a GPU is composed of uh, multiple units that you can see as kind of cores on your CPU. Uh, 
Uh, so in the case of NVIDIA, they call these units uh, streaming multiprocessors, and AMD call that uh, compute units. Okay, and basically the execution of the threads on the GPU is organized in blocks. And these blocks are executed on the streaming multiprocessor or the compute units and air uh, restraints to uh, these uh, compute unit or streaming multiprocessor. So you have your raw GPU, okay? And then you have these multiple uh, streaming multiprocessor or compute unit that compose these uh, GPUs, okay? So you have the thread blocks and uh, AMD called that uh, a work groups. AMD takes the, the, the name of these things from uh, OpenCL. Okay, and inside each of these compute unit or multiple uh, multi streaming multiprocessors, you have uh, some kind of uh, cores in the case of NVIDIA, so they call that uh, CUDA cores, and uh, you also have some kind of uh, TIMD uh, in the case of uh, AMD, so basically vector uh, units. So you have your uh, or GPU, then you move to your streaming multiprocessor or compute unit that you can see as cores. And then inside of these cores, you have uh, some kind of vector units that allow for threads to run in a parallel, but you have to understand as it's a uh, run in a CMD fashion, that these uh, threads are then subdivided in smaller blocks. In the case of NVIDIA, they call that the warps and it's composed of 32 threads that execute in lock steps. So it means that uh, these 32 step uh, threads execute the same instruction at the same time, okay? Uh, in the case of AMD, uh, they call that uh, six work items that compose a wave front, okay? And this is 64 work items that will again execute exactly the same instruction at the same time. So they are scheduling group of 32 or 64, depending on the vendors. Okay, and this bundle of threads are uh, executed in what we can call a vector units, but they are confined to uh, the streaming multiprocessor or the uh, compute unit of the thread blocks they belong to. So when we do this, okay, uh, meaning we move the execution to the device and then say we have a parallel for that we want to uh, sp uh, spawn a team of threads and then divide the loop iteration among the threads. What we are basically doing is that we create only one team of threads and this team of threads will use only one of the compute unit or one of the streaming uh, multiprocessor on the GPU, meaning that we are wasting a lot of uh, resources that are available to you to us on the GPU. And uh, the reason for that is that OpenMP needs to be consistent of uh, in the syntax and what is allowed in a parallel region compared to what was already present for uh, normal execution on uh, a CPU. And the problem is due to some limitation in the GPU hardware. Uh, in theory, no synchronization or memory funds are possible between uh, streaming multiprocessors or compute units. Uh, this is, may not be completely true on recent hardware, but in general, uh, you have a thread block that is able to synchronize between the, all the threads in the thread blocks are capable of synchronizing between themselves, okay? Because they belong to the same streaming multiprocessor and compute unit, but between compute units, you cannot uh, synchronize threads. The same is true for, for, for example, cache coherence. Uh, you have some kind of level one cache or a shared memory that is available on the compute unit and streaming multiprocessors, but you cannot share a data or nor have a cache coherency between the L1 cache present on the streaming multiprocessors, okay? And if we think about what is going on on this, uh, the normal execution of uh, OpenMP, the normal OpenMP or CPU, uh, you can create parallel region, work sharing and task, okay? Work share the, the, the work uh, to the, the threads in the parallel region, but you are also allowed to have a barrier, critical section, locks, atomics. All of this, of course, is possible uh, if you execute only on one compute unit, but it's not possible if you execute on uh, multiple compute units. It means that if we only use 
uh, parallel uh, region, then we have a problem because we cannot apply, for example, a barrier or a critical uh, region to the whole uh, GPU. So we need to think about the fact that GPUs and accelerators most of the time are different from the CPU, so we need an additional uh, construct. And in order to keep all the characteristics that were true for a parallel region of the CPU, they create a new level of parallelism, which is a team with a team's construct and multiple teams are spawned, okay? And each start with the master thread, and then the master thread can spawn a team of threads with a parallel construct. And this parallel that this team of threads will be scheduled uh, on a particular compute unit or streaming multiprocessor, and then we can uh, use barrier, critical region, locks, and atomics, so we can have synchronization. Okay, so uh, threads in different teams cannot synchronize, but if threads are in the same team, then they can synchronize. So problem solved, we have created uh, a solution. So basically, what you can do is uh, create first uh, offloading execution. Okay, you do uh, opening the target, which means that you offload execution to the device, and then you cre can create a league of teams. And this is done using the teams uh, directive. Okay, so the teams construct is reached, a league of team is created, and then the initial threads of each team execute uh, the team region. Uh, note that uh, only one thread at that point is uh, enabled. Okay, you have only the master thread that is running. And then you have the distribute uh, construct that will distribute, uh, that applies, sorry, to uh, loops. And basically it means that uh, you have to distribute the iteration of a loop across uh, the teams. And in this case, again, only one thread is active, the master thread, so the master threads will execute the uh, iteration that are uh, attributed to its uh, team, okay? So when you have this loop with 1,000 iteration, it means that each team, uh, if you spawn four teams, will do 250 iteration, and these iteration will be uh, executed by the master thread of the team. Uh, in addition, you can be uh, search for some optimization specifying the number of teams and the number the thread limits, so the maximum number of threads in each uh, teams. Uh, if you are familiar with IP or CUDA, basically a team is a thread block, okay, and then you can specify the number of threads present in that block. Um, so you can use this clause specifying the number of teams as well as the thread limits, and you will have also runtime functions that helps you uh, get information about the number of teams that were spawned, uh, also the number of the team, your threads, the coding threads belong to. Uh, you can also query the uh, maximum number of threads, okay, and the threads, the teams, sorry, like uh, the threads if uh, for the, the when you execute OpenMP on CPU. Uh, are assigned a number that corresponds to, uh, to starting from zero to the number of teams minus one. Okay, so if we go back to our uh, SACSP example, so the first version we use only a parallel four, which means that we were uh, only spawning one team executing on one compute unit or streaming multiprocessor. And so we use only a part of the device. So if we want to use the full device, uh, then we use a team distribute parallel four. So you can see that OpenMP is quite verbose in this case. Uh, so basically telling the compiler that we want to create multiple teams. Uh, most of the time OpenMP will create the number of teams that correspond to the number of streaming multiprocessor or compute unit. Then we want first to distribute the iteration to the master threads of the teams, and then the master thread will spawn a parallel uh, team, and then all the threads in uh, this uh, team will uh, be uh, assigned some iteration of the loop with the four uh, directives. So when we do that with the teams parallel, uh, sorry, teams distribute parallel four, we enable the full parallelism on the device by activating first uh, some kind of thread blocks and then 
uh, assigning some iteration to uh, these uh, thread blocks, and then inside of these thread blocks, assign the iterations to uh, the threads. Okay, other example. And this is in order to uh, go for a more complex example, not just with a, a simple loop. Here we have uh, two loops that are tightly nested. Okay, and we have some kind of uh, iteration. So basically the uh, idea is that uh, we use a stencil code and each step uh, until convergence, we compute new values. Okay, the, the value at step n plus one is computed from the, the value at the preceding set, uh, the previous step. Okay, and in order to compute one point on our grid, we need the value uh, on uh, the top, the bottom, uh, the left and uh, the right, okay? And this is basically all you want uh, to implement that if you were on the CPU, okay? So you have a while loop uh, until uh, the error or uh, the number of iter maximum iteration is reached, okay? And then you have the, this tightly uh, nested loop going through the 2D grids, okay? With G and I, and then we compute, we update each point with uh, the old value Okay, so we have two arrays that we use U new and U old. And on uh, CPU, this is how you want to implement that. Okay, so basically using only parallelism on uh, the other loop so that each thread have a um, sufficient amount of work by executing all the iteration on the uh, I loop. And then of course you use a reduction clause, this reduction clause in order to uh, have the final maximum value and in a way that is uh, thread safe so that uh, we don't have some kind of uh, dead errors. So this is the uh, CPU implementation. Uh, based on what we have seen with uh, the uh, Saxby example, we can say, okay, it would be very easy to uh, move to the GPU. We uh, just spawn a team of threads and distribute the iteration and then parallel four again. Uh, of course, we have to specify that we need to have a reduction on the maximum error and then move the data you old and you new to uh, and from uh, the GPU. So we can say, oh, yeah, it's very easy to port. We uh, jobs uh, done. Okay. So for that, we will see if we did a pretty good job. Uh, so first we ran uh, all code on the CPU, okay, with the first version the, the, that I present only by parallelizing uh, the other loop, okay, and we go from and we test for different uh, number of threads, okay, with one thread, so the serial execution, we have about 28.5 uh, uh, seconds of execution, uh, and we have pretty good scaling up to uh, eight threads, and then it's a little bit uh, less optimal uh, when we go to 16 and 32 threads. Still with 32 threads, we get a speed, of, speed up of 20.6 uh, uh, times uh, compared to a serial execution. Now, if uh, we run it on, uh, for example, an AMD MI100 or an NVIDIA V100, then uh, basically we get a small speed up with the AMD, but on NVIDIA, then we the, the result is quite uh, bad. We have uh, the execution is basically more than two times slower uh, compared to the serial execution. Okay, so what's going on here? Why is it so bad? So to understand, we can do a quick profiling. Uh, for example, on NVIDIA, uh, you can use NVProf. Uh, in the case of AMD, uh, they provide an uh, environment variable that you can uh, specify uh, in your environment and then uh, the OpenMP runtime will do some kind of uh, timing uh, information dump. And this is what you get when you do that. And what's going on here, let's have a look. This is what happens at every iteration, okay? Because the, the full output is way too long. So at every iteration, if uh, we go back to the code, okay, so every iteration, what we are doing is, okay, moving data and do execute uh, the kernel. 
And this is what we see. We have some allocation on the device, and then we have some data movement with the data submit async, then some other allocation on the device, and then again, data movement. You can see that there's a very long transfer and a very short one. So basically this is uh, UO that is transferred at the beginning, and then you have a small transfer. This is uh, error, okay? The, this is a Scala, so it's quite fast to copy. And then you have the actual execution of the kernel. And then again, you have some copy. So error is coming back to the host. And then you have new, new old that uh, come uh, back to the host. And then you have some synchronization before uh, data are deallocated on uh, the device. So we are doing that at every iteration, okay, on the while loop. Uh, so in this case, I set the maximum number of iteration to be 100. It doesn't reach convergence, but so I have uh, all the time exactly the same number of iteration. And the problem is that the time for transferring data is way, way, way much larger than the time needed for uh, the uh, execution on, of the compute kernel to uh, the uh, GPU. So it means that most of the time is spent copying data to and from the GPU instead of doing actual computation. Okay, you can see that we are uh, way uh, above an order of magnitude. So the problem is that at every iteration, yeah, we are copying data. But it will be better, of course, to keep the data on the GPU and avoid all these uh, useless uh, data movement. And for that, we have what is called a data region. Okay, because now from the quick profiling, we know that the, jack, the problem of our code is that we move too much data. And of course, the PCI bus is way slower than the, 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 the actual GPU memory. So of course, this is a, a major bottleneck. Uh, so the idea is that we can use, uh, instead of uh, the macros on the target region, use a target data region. Okay, so the idea is to create one data region that will uh, spread across all the, the while loop and move the data once at the beginning of the execution and move it again at the end of the execution of the device. Okay. And so the idea of a, tar uh, a target region is that you can apply all exactly the same uh, macros that you use for the target uh, team's directive. Okay, but in this case, you will just uh, specify that this uh, uh, a data region, okay? And then you have an end and a beginning, which is explicitly specified in Fortran or in C, you used the curly brace. So for example, in this case, the whole while loop will be uh, the data region, okay? So we create a data region and we say that we want new world and uh, to be uh, copied and uh, back into to and from the GPU, and in this case, we don't need uh, to, the, to use the initial value of uh, UNU, so we just do uh, an alloc, okay? And this means that we can remove all the map clothes that we were present there before, and basically the data will be present on the device for the entire duration of the data region, meaning the whole uh, while loop. So we don't have data that uh, move every time we do an iteration. Uh, except, of course, uh, the error, okay, that will be uh, copied to and from the GPU at a, uh, every time. This is something I forget to mention. If you specify a reduction variables, uh, the uh, uh, compiler know that it makes sense that these variables come back to the host at the end, which means that this is an exception to the first private rules for the scanner. If you specify a variable in a reduction clause, then the default mapping attribute become to from, okay? So error, we don't need to specify any mapping attribute. It will be go, go back to the host at the end. Another option is to use what is called unstructured data region with a standalone directives, which uh, start with OpenMP enter data when uh, you move data to the GPU and you have uh, the uh, equivalent clause, uh, sorry, directive OpenMP target exit data to move data from uh, the GPU, okay? 
uh, or as well as the allocate data and allocate data in the case of an inter data grid. And between these directives, you can also use the OMP target update to or from, which uh, basically allows you to update value from and to the host in the middle of a, a data uh, region. So what it looks like is that, uh, of course, you can use it also the update a directive with a structured data region. So here we create a data region where we map to from uh, the A array. Okay, but then in the middle of it, we can do, okay, I want uh, the, the, the array back to the host and we use that the target update from, okay, we copy from the device, do something with A on the host and then copy it back to uh, the GPU with a target update to copying data to uh, the reader. So it can be used uh, with unstructured or structured data region. And basically if you use, you, you uh, take the uh, Jacobi code with unstructured data region, uh, then uh, basically it looks like this, okay, where you map uh, only in this case, so you enter data and you only say, okay, copy the data from the host because we are entering the region and allocate you new. And then uh, you have to be very explicit at the end also saying, okay, we, I want you old back. So I do a from operation and I delete you new. So it's a little bit different from the, uh, what we have done previously where basically we don't need to specify that we want to deallocate at the end. This is automatic in a structure one, okay, but, uh, in the case of an unstructured data region, then we uh, need to be more uh, specific. Uh, the advantage of an unstructured uh, data region is that it can be, uh, it can match the data lifetime more closely if you allocate, for example, your array in a different uh, source file or in a different function, then uh, it's easier to use unstructured data region because of course, structured data region that start and end with a curly brace cannot be presented in different source files, and you cannot specify a data region that is for multiple function. Okay, this is impossible. A, a structured data region is limited to the same lexical scope. It's impossible to uh, use it in a different lexical scope. So if you have data that is allocated in a different function or different uh, source file, that uh, this unstructured data is uh, the best option. So we have removed all this un unnecessary data movement. And we can see now that we get a six times speed up compared to the serial execution or compared to uh, the 1.1 1 uh, that we get before. On NVIDIA also, we get some kind of a major improvement compared to what was happening uh, before. So removing all these data movement improved massively the performance. But still, uh, we are far from the best uh, possible performance. And we are about the performance on what, what we get uh, on uh, eight tracks on uh, the, the CPU. So we expect from an uh, expensive device like uh, MI100 or a, a V100 that are about 10,000 uh, euros to <coughs> perform a little bit better uh, than that. So what can we do to improve? Well, the problem is that in the previous version, when we basically uh, only parallelize the other loop, we miss a lot of uh, parallelism. Only parallelizing uh, the other loop in the case of the CPU is not a big deal. It's even recommended so that the threads have sufficient amount of work, but GPU don't behave like this. Uh, basically on GPU, what you need to do is expose as much parallelism as possible, give as much threads to the GPU as you can, because uh, the GPU needs uh, to have a lot of threads in order to uh, work efficiently. Uh, yeah, it's explained in the next slide. And basically what we do is uh, just parallelize the other loop with the J loop among teams. 
Okay, so we create teams of threads and then distribute the J loop among the teams. And then we uh, enable the teams of threads, so the threads in, in the teams to work on uh, the J loop, so the I loop, sorry, so that we have, uh, we fully exploit all the available parallel first by doing uh, distribution of the J loop among the teams and then uh, do a distribution of the I loops among across the uh, threads in uh, the team. And of course, we need to specify that we do a reduction at these two levels. Uh, this is, of course, uh, so that the code still uh, is correct. And when we do that, massive improvement. So we get um, almost 30, uh, 30 times speed ups, uh, but on NVIDIA, it's not perfect. We have an improvement, but only a seven times speed ups. And why do we see this uh, improvement? So basically we have increased the parallelism. And as I said, on CPU, it's not a problem to only parallelize the other loop, it's even recommended. But on GPU, the problem is that you need to be able to hide uh, memory latency because you don't have all these fancy stuff that is available on the CPU, where basically you have a cache and a very complex scheduler, but try to determine when the data needs to be present in the cache so that it runs efficiently. This is what the CPU does. You don't have this fancy uh, scheduler on GPUs. Uh, it means that uh, the, the GPU don't, doesn't really plan in advance which kind of data needs to be present. When you reach a load and store instruction, basically the, the wall, warp, or wavefront gets stored waiting for the data to uh, arrive. But the GPU has another option is to schedule a new, uh, a new wavefront or a new warp to execute while it's waiting for the data on another warp or wavefront. So you need to have sufficient amount of threads in order to be able to have some kind of uh, some uh, threads eligible for execution, not waiting and being stored in memory uh, access, but just wanting to do some uh, compute. Then if you have sufficient number of threads, it means that you can hide the memory latency because the, the scheduler on the GPU will always find a thread that is uh, um, eligible for execution while other threads are just stuck into waiting for data to arrive from the global memory. Okay. And by just enable, using the other loop, we don't enable any sufficient parallelism to hide uh, the memory uh, access latency. So this is why parallelizing the two loops is important. But we have another option to enable more parallelism because we see that uh, the NVIDIA compiler doesn't do a great job in uh, using this uh, parallelization across teams and then across threads. So the other option we have, and which is basically if you have a tiki nested nice look, probably the best uh, starting point is to do a, a user collapse close. Okay, the collapse close is there. It means that uh, when you uh, apply a collapse close to a loop, okay, it means that the loop associated with this uh, collapse close will be uh, collapsed into one iteration space. So here in this case, we have two tightly nested loop with no instruction that are executed between them, very important. And we can basically collapse them into one loop. So the compiler will do all the work on transforming your code so that it's still correct. Okay, basically we create one giant uh, iteration space, only one loop that is the result of the collapsing of these two loops. Okay, and the number that you uh, specify in the collapse clause indicates the number of uh, loops that you want to collapse. Because of course, we, you may have a very tightly nested loop with four loops. I don't know, and you want to collapse only two, then you say uh, that you want to collapse two if you want all the loops to be collapsed then you say four, for example. So in, in our case, we are limited to two loops and we specify that you want uh, to fully collapse them. And when we do that, we have a small deterioration in the performance of the MI100, but it's not very significant. 
uh, but we have a significant improvement on the NVIDIA hardware. And basically, uh, the NVIDIA compiler is quite good at doing some analysis if you give them uh, give them, uh, give it uh, some um, freedom. And what happens there is that by collapsing the loop, we present to the compiler the full iteration space, and then it does whatever it wants to optimize it. Um, it's as uh, much as possible. So uh, basically, the NVIDIA compiler do a good job when you give him more freedom. This is the reason why uh, when you collapse, you get a better performance. So as I say in the introduction, OpenMP is very descriptive. You see that. I mean, we have to specify that we want, every, even for one loop, we want to specify that we are distributing across teams and then uh, create uh, enabling parallelism inside these teams and then uh, the dividing the iteration um, um, and uh, spreading them across the team. So this is very verbose. You have to specify team, this we will parallel loop, okay? But basically this is because OpenMP is very descriptive. Okay, you give precise instruction to the compiler on how to generate parallel code. And you say that you want it in a specific way. Okay, and uh, you don't give the compiler a lot of options. And then we will go to another option, which is OpenACC, which is very prescriptive, okay? Uh, where basically OpenACC, you tell the compiler that a loop can be parallelized, meaning that it can be executed in any order and concurrently. And then the compiler is free to run them in a parallel way, uh, any way you choose. And um, choose a different mapping different depending on the hardware that, uh, that uh, you target. And um, one of the uh, constructs you can use with OpenECC, okay? So we replace the OpenMP with ECC, saying to compiler that this is an OpenMP, OpenECC directive. And then we have the kernel construct. It defines the region that is to be compiled into a sequence of kernel, okay? But it doesn't give any more information. So basically what I did there is that I have two loops and I create a kernel region. And what I say to the compiler doing this is, okay, these two loops somewhere find a way to parallelize them because I know they can be parallelized. So do your stuff and uh, create the appropriate kernels. So what the, there is a huge chance in this case that the compiler will generate uh, two kernels. Okay, one for uh, the first loop and uh, a second for uh, the second loop. And these two will execute uh, on uh, the GPU. Okay, but we didn't give any additional information about what to do. This is up to the compiler to do the analysis and uh, make sure that uh, the loop can be parallelized and that a kernel running on the GPU can be generated. But you have another option, which is uh, the parallel construct. So very similar to uh, OpenMP, but it doesn't do exactly the same thing. Basically the OpenACC uh, parallel construct is the equivalent on, of the uh, OpenMP target construct. So it tells the compiler that the execution needs to be moved to the GPU. And with this uh, construct, uh, you don't tell the compiler that, you, uh, that it has to uh, do the analysis in order to find parallelism and to generate kernel. You just say this needs to be moved to uh, the uh, GPU. So start parallel execution on the device. And then if, to mark the parallelism, we use the loop directive, okay? So this loop can be run in parallel. So we say to the compiler, hey, this is a parallel loop, do whatever you want with it, but it needs to be parallelized. And the same for this one. So this is different from the kernel one. The kernel one, we specify, we say nothing about where the parallelism needs to be the, um, is to be found. This is the compiler that do the job. In this case, we're way more explicit, and we basically say to the compiler, this is a, a region that needs to be executed on the CPU. This is uh, this is the loop that can be run in parallel. Okay, so you are a little bit more in control when using. A parallel compared to kernels. Of course, like OpenMP, you have some uh, data movement clause. Uh, 
So they apply to the kernels and parallel um, constructs, and uh, they're very similar to the one you have uh, in OpenMP. You have create that allocate memory on the device. You have delete to deallocate memory on the device. Then you have copy in, which uh, allocate memory on the device and copy the value from the host to the, de the device memory. Copy out, which is the opposite, where you allocate memory on the device, okay? And then we will, you will fill uh, the memory from the device and at the end of the execution on the, of the, de on the device, you will move the result uh, produced to the host. And finally, you have copy, which is a combination of copy and copy out. So basically create is alloc in OpenMP, delete is exactly the same. Uh, copy in is uh, to, copy out is from, and copy is to, from. Like OpenMP, you will also have data region, okay? Uh, the structured data region is marked as a primary ACC data. Uh, so of course, most of, you don't have the equivalent of the target saying, okay, in OpenMP, you say OpenMP target data because you say, I, I want that to be on the device. As op OpenACC is designed for accelerator from the ground up, you don't need to specify that because it's obvious that it goes to an accelerator, okay? So you have Pragma ACC data, meaning that you're creating a data region on the accelerator. And then uh, you have uh, unstructured data region that you can also create. And the syntax is very similar to the one of uh, opening NP, you have ACC enter data and ACC uh, exit data. Okay, and you have of course the update method. So same example as the one with OpenMP. Okay, we create, uh -oh, there is no target there. there is I want to correct that. No. Well, anyway, so it's primary CC data, okay, not target data. And then uh, you have ACC update. And when you want to update the value, okay, from the, va the device to the host, you say, I want to update the value on the host, okay, so it's not too from like. In the case of OpenMP, you say, hey, I want to update the value on the host. Okay, it means copying the value that was on the device and bringing back to the host. And you have the update device, which means that you want to take the data that is present on the host and you want to update the value to uh, the, uh, on the device. Okay, uh, host as an equivalent that is uh, also called uh, self. Okay. Uh, but I, I think that OS is way more explicit than using uh, self. Self was uh, the, the original, uh, originally used in the specification, and then they find it. It was quite confusing uh, to, to because it doesn't mean anything with self but with respect to what. So they introduced the host instead of self, but self is still uh, used. Okay, and of course the update directive, as the update directive in the case of OpenMP, can be used. Uh, in the middle of a, a structured data region or an unstructured uh, data region. Okay, so if we go back to the SACSP example, of course, we have two ways to implement it, uh, either with a kernel directive, and we say, let the compiler do uh, everything for us. Of course, we need uh, to copy uh, the data, but for the rest, uh, it's perfectly fine to just use the kernel for this kind of course of code where we have only one loop. It's pretty easy to the compiler to find, find out uh, what to do. Or the other option is creating a parallel region saying, I want to offload that to the GPU and then uh, do uh, a loop, uh, add a loop directive saying that the next loop can be uh, parallelized. So this is the two options you have. Most of the time it's, easier to uh, use the parallel loop construct, of course, because then you explicitly tell the compilers what you want to do, and you are sure that if you change compiler, you can expect the compiler to understand what you expect uh, from it. And about compilers, uh, it's not as widely supported as OpenMP, OpenACC. Uh, OpenACC was originally 
more, more widely supported, but then to support uh, drugs as NVIDIA, I would say, take more and more over the organization and uh, most of the vendors were not interested anymore. So basically the best compiler you can uh, use is the NVIDIA compiler that is uh, present, for example, in the NVIDIA HPC SDK, okay? And the syntax is quite uh, similar to the one uh, of the OpenMP a compilation, you specify that uh, you activate, sorry, uh, OpenACC interpretation with the ACC uh, flag, and then you can have more information on what the GPU is doing with ME4 acid ACC, and then of course the target GPU that you want to, to use and your source file. There is support for uh, OpenACC uh, in GCC, but same remark as the one uh, I made for OpenMP, uh, the performance is okay in recent version, but just okay. So it's not uh, the best uh, implementation. Um, as a side note, uh, some commercial compilers, but of course, they're not uh, public. You need to have a specific machine to have access to them. Also have support for uh, OpenECC. And this is, for example, the case from uh, HP Cray that uh, recently um, renew its uh, commitment to at least support OpenECC in uh, Fortran on uh, NVIDIA and in the uh, GPUs. Now, uh, if we uh, go back to the Jacobi example, uh, again, it's very, very similar to what we have uh, done in OpenMP. Uh, of course, I will not go through the whole process of, of optimizing the code and finding out why, the, why it's slow. We go directly, I would say, to the conclusion uh, because it's, uh, of course, we already did all the analysis with OpenMP. And of course, all I said about min minimizing the data movement and providing the maximum uh, possible way for the compiler to uh, use all the parallelism is still all true in the case of OpenACC, uh, meaning that in uh, this case, we can start by just uh, saying, okay, creating a parallel execution. So move the execution of the loop nest to the device and then indicate that the next loop can be parallelized. And of course that we have a reduction. So very similar syntax to what we have done with OpenMP. And then again, say that the inner loop is parallelizable and that we can uh, we have a reduction that is uh, we have a reduction inside of this loop very similar to opening B just less verbose we just specify uh, where the parallel loops are and let the compiler do the work of course the second option is to use exactly the same uh, thing that we did with OpenMP and say that, okay, this is a parallel loopness and that we want to uh, collapse it. Uh, we want to collapse it with uh, the collapse close. And again, this is two loops that we want to collapse. So you see very similar, it's just the way uh, it is designed in the fact that first it's only, uh, it's be, it has only been designed for accelerator from the ground up and also the fact that it lets the compiler more options and the uh, programmer have less, uh, I would say, description to do in the code to explain to the compiler what you want to achieve. You basically have uh, a main directive that tells uh, the compiler where you want to offload execution and then a loop directive. So this, that goes with uh, the parallel saying, hey, this is a parallel loop, please uh, parallelize it to uh, the device. While in OpenMP, you have a little bit more work to do and you have to describe a little bit more. But the advantage of OpenMP, of course, is that you can, um, in, with the same API, parallelize your code on the GPU as well as on the CPU, because of course, all the parallel, um, constructs that apply to the uh, CPU can be used um, on top of the uh, target uh, directive 
Uh, this is not the case in the case of OpenFCC. If you want also to multi-thread your uh, host execution, then you need to combine OpenFP and OpenFCC because OpenFCC in, uh, itself doesn't cover uh, multi-threading execution. Of course, the compiler can uh, generate code for multi-threaded, but then you are limited to multi-threading. It's not possible to combine multi-threading plus GPU execution. Okay, so comments about how to access data uh, in your code on the GPU. So may, speaking about coalescent memory access. So what is coalescent memory access? So it refers to uh, basically combining multiple access into a single transaction. Uh, this is true also on the CPU where you have some cache line. Okay, when the, some, the data is moved to the cache, you, it comes into chunk, most of the time of 64 bytes. This is true also on uh, the GPU. The difference is that on the CPU, it's not really interesting to have multiple writes on the same cache line because then you have some problem with cache coherency and cache line being validated and moving back and forth from the cache to the global memory. On the GPU, if you have multiple threads accessing the same uh, chunks of memory, this is very beneficial. And why? Okay. When a thread accesses the GPU global memory, it always accesses it in chunk, okay? In, in, uh, if another thread accesses the same chunk at the same time, then the chunk can be reused, okay? We basically move multiple bits of the multiple speeds of data at the same time, and it's used by multiple threads. So we are reducing the uh, number of memory transactions, okay? So the most efficient access is when threads read or write contiguous memory location. And it will happen because the threads are scheduled in block, remember, okay? You have the warps and the wavefronts. So basically you have either 32 threads or 64 threads that execute exactly the same instruction at the same time, meaning that these 32 or 64 threads will execute the load and store operation at the same time. So if you have access to contiguous memory uh, blocks, it means also that the number of these chunks that need to be moved is uh, reduced compared to uh, uncoalescent memory access, where you do a strided access and of course, the number of memory transaction is uh, higher because basically you uh, need to move uh, a lot of data that is not necessarily uh, used by your threads. So in my example, we have only four threads, okay? Considering that uh, the memory block is composed of four pieces, if you use the four threads, then you have only one memory transaction. And if you consider the strided access patterns that basically touch four of these blocks, you have four, a memory transaction. So of course, this is not optimal. And uh, this is quite important if you consider the way sometimes you write your code. Okay, um, if you consider, for example, array of structures or structures of array, uh, the way uh, the, the threads on the GPU will access this kind of structure is, uh, of course, uh, may have a significant uh, impact on the performance compared to what you have on the uh, CPU. Okay, so the first option is the uh, array of structure. Okay, we have the structure with points, X, Y, Z. Okay, and then we create an array of them. Or the other option is to create a structure and inside of the structure, we have arrays with the Y, Z and uh, the X, Y, Z value, okay, stored in an array. It means that if your threads, okay, read this point and first to touch, I don't know, you set the value of X and then the value of Y and the value of Z, okay? All your threads, uh, you have three steps, okay? Represented by uh, these colors. And if you are on the GPU and all these threads, of course, execute in lockstep, it means that you have multiple threads that will access the X and then multiple threads trying to access Y and Z. Of course, you uh, in the case of a structure of array, you have uh, coalescent memory access, it's perfect. If you uh, use a structure, an array of structure, then of course you will touch different, uh, you have trided access and this is not as efficient. So while array of structure may be interesting on the CPU, because on the CPU, of course, if you do the X, Y, Z assignments, okay, 
and then the continuous in memory, it will be in the same cache. So it's very cache friendly for the CPU, but then it's not as um, sympathetic for the uh, GPU. So sometimes you have to uh, think about your data structure and change it a little bit in order to get uh, efficient execution on the GPU. Another option uh, that I not explain here is of course use uh, some kind of tight uh, pattern in order to store your data. Uh, but note also that uh, the fact to use a structure of array in some cases may be very beneficial also on the CPU because it enables you to do some kind of uh, vectorization. So um, use the vector unit on your uh, CPU as well. So in some case, while it's not always cache friendly, uh, the structure of array is good for the GPU as well as the CPU if you want to vectorize. Okay, let's wrap up. Uh, so OpenMP and OpenCC allows you to target GPUs with a very few directives uh, added to your uh, serial code, okay? And indeed, adding these uh, directives is quite uh, easy, but uh, you have to take into account that transferring data between the host and the device is quite an expensive process. And that as we have seen with the Jacobi code on OpenMP, the data transfer may be the main bottleneck of your code if you don't handle them carefully. Uh, and of course you need to uh, think about your data transfer and only transfer data required to, your device, to the device execution. And the idea is to keep the data on the device as long as possible by using a structured data region or unstructured data region depending on the use case. And uh, of course, you need to have sufficient parallelism in order to achieve good performance, meaning that you need to expose more parallelism than for the CPUs, of course, because on the CPU, you have a few cores, 64 cores maximum, maybe 128 if you consider two sockets. Uh, of course, on the GPU, you have way more, you have thousands of cores or SIMD lane. Uh, which means that uh, you need to expose way more parallelism in order to uh, execute efficiently. So it can be done by distributing the loops across team or and across threads, or of course, marking multiple loops to be parallelized in the case of OpenSCC. And uh, in the case of tightly nested loop, uh, loop collapsing is also an option. So this concludes this introduction to uh, based uh, GPU programming and